verse. That's what it's referred to. Isaiah chapter 43, verse number 1. But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. And here is the fireman's verse. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Saba in your place. I want to speak to you for a few minutes about being a first responder for God. You know, I, I could be wrong. I'm usually not, but sometimes I am. Uh, I don't remember this term, first responder, being used a lot before 9-11. Maybe it was. I just don't remember hearing it a lot. But ever since September 11th, I've heard this term, first responders, more prevalent today. Right? And first responders refer to firemen, policemen, emergency medical teams, right? These are individuals who quickly respond to people when there's a crisis situation. And it seems every week, and all of us, we all know this, we're turning on our television, and they're on the news, there's some shooting in some mall, or recently in a, in a synagogue, fires in Northern California, and I just came back from the Bay Area, and I didn't even see the Bay Area. Now, it sounds funny, but I'm not making, it's not a joke. When we were flying in, it wasn't fog. I thought it was fog, but it wasn't fog. It was smoke covering the entire Bay Area. We went to downtown San Francisco on Saturday, and people were walking around with masks. The smoke was so heavy. You actually couldn't even see the buildings. Uh, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, of firefighters up there in the uh, Northern California area fighting fires. So it seems that every week we turn on the television and it's almost becoming common where we see a, a shooting taking place at a school, a terrorist attack, or some natural disasters like the flood there or the hurricane there in Puerto Rico or Florida or Texas. So these individuals, these firemen, these policemen, these emergency medical personnel, they are people who are called upon to respond quickly to a crisis situation. In other words, they don't hesitate. They don't question the act, and they don't look for a shortcut out. These are the real heroes in our society. Not the ball players, not the actors. They play heroes. The ball players are well uh, gifted, well skilled, and well paid, by the way. Huh? But they're not really our heroes. They asked Jim Brown, the Hall of Fame running back from the Cleveland Browns, to define a hero, and he said, people put heroes on their shoulders. But heroes, real heroes, put people on their shoulders. Uh, these are the first responders. The people, I say that, don't hesitate, who respond quickly and readily to a crisis situation. And when you look at God's word this morning, Right? Are there any first responders in the word of God? Well, not in the sense of policemen or firemen. But there were people in the Bible who actually didn't quite respond to the Lord right away. So I wouldn't classify them as first responders. Now, eventually they responded and came and grew up to be tremendous people of God. For example, Moses. Moses wasn't exactly a first responder. Because when God called him there, you know the story. You read the scripture. You saw the movie. He's standing there in front of the burning bush, and the Lord calls him. He says, Moses, I've chosen you to go back to Egypt, right? Stand before Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Moses says, what? No way. Time out. No way. I can't go. And Moses started making excuses for avoiding the will of God, for avoiding the call of God upon his life. I mean, we're real good at making excuses, especially when we get challenged to participate in a function of the church when we get called upon to serve as an usherette or a security or children's ministry or evangelism or prayer team whatever it may be or ask to sing in the worship team we come up with excuses Moses came up with all kinds of excuses 
What do you mean? He goes, I'm slow of speech. I don't know how to talk very good. He goes, that's okay. I'll put my words in your mouth. But they're not going to believe me. What's your name? He even had the audacity to ask God for his ID. What's your name? Then he said, you know, I don't have any power. I don't have any authority. He said, stick your hand in your vest. And he stuck it in. And when he pulled it out, it was full of leprosy. He said, now put it back. And then the Lord healed it. He said, what is in your hand? He said, a, a rod. He said, throw it down. He threw it down, and God turned the rod into a serpent. In other words, Moses ran out of excuses. He eventually had to respond to the call of God upon his life. What kind of excuse are you making this morning? What, you're too old? Huh? I don't find any retirement fund in the Bible. I don't find any age limit when it comes to being used by God. If you can breathe, you can be used of God. Uh, what excuse are you using for not finding your place in the body of Christ? We're always good at making excuses. Another one in the Bible who wasn't exactly a first responder is Jonah. God came to Jonah and said, I want you to rise up, go to Nineveh, and preach my word. And Jonah, Jonah got up, and he did exactly that. He got up. He went and bought a, a ticket on a boat and went in the opposite direction. He started running from his calling. You wonder how many are running from their calling this morning? Huh? And you know the story. Jonah got on that boat. He started sailing in the opposite direction. And I think God said, you know what? I think I know what I have here. I got a hard head. I got a stubborn individual. How I many you know God knows how to deal with us? Especially those of us that are stubborn. Hard-headed. Huh? You guys are, ah, I know. Okay. And so God allowed a storm to come. Right? And Jonah, instead of right there saying, okay, 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 okay God, I get the message. No, he still resisted. How many people still finally, even after all the stuff that they go through, are still resisting the will of God within their life? It's like some of your family. They still resist salvation. Some of your, your sons and daughters still resist. They see the change in your life. They see the miracle that God did in your life, but yet they still resist. And you can see it as they come. You saw many of your family for Thanksgiving, and you were looking at your cousins. You were looking at some of your relatives, and you can see the resistance in their life. For Jonah, he went down to the bottom of the boat thinking, I'm just going to go to bed. I'm going to go to sleep. And when I wake up, it'll all be gone. Huh? It would be good, like, it would be great if life worked like that. If you could just sleep your problems away. Come on, somebody. And so Jonah went down to the bottom of the boat, fell asleep. But the storm remained. And finally, the captain of the ship came. Now, it's a sad thing when the world has to rebuke the church. The captain came down and said, Jonah, I think you're the reason for this. I think, you know, there should, we shouldn't be having any of this inclement weather. But I think you're the cause of this. You're bad luck. And you know, there's only a certain amount of mercy and compassion you're going to find in the world. The captain didn't say, well, Jonah, we're going to drop you off at the nearest port. The, fear, the nearest port we're going to find, we're going to drop you off and we'll call it that. Okay, is that all right? We'll refund you your money. Not that what he did. You know the story. He threw him out of the boat. And now Jonah is in the middle of the sea in calm, because now the storm, the storm passed. The boat went on its way, and there's Jonah in the water. And the water was smooth. Oh, this is nice. Okay, all right. Okay, I'll be okay from here. I can swim back to shore. I'm in smooth water now. Huh? All my problems are solved. No, no. Huh? The real Jaws came, amen. Uh -huh. Not Bruce, that fake shark, amen. That was the shark's name in Jaws, Bruce, amen. Huh? And the Bible says that Jonah, you guys know, was swallowed up by a great fish. And there he is, he ends up in the belly of a fish. And now after all that, he says, okay, God, I get the message. I mean, what does God have to do in order for you and I to get the message? Do we have to end up in a belly of a fish? Do we have to end up in a stinking, dark, ugly place within our life for us to say, okay, God, okay, God, okay, God, I get your message. 
question is, how do you get out of the belly of a fish? You pray your way out. The Bible says that Jonah prayed. Huh? And the fish regurgitated, threw him up, vomited him out. And Jonah ends up on the seashore. And the Bible says that the mission and the message remain the same. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. How many know God is the God of the second chance? and the third chance and the fourth chance God is the God of another chance somebody say amen another example is one it's not quite fair because the situation is unique but it's Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 3 there's young Samuel a young boy and the Lord calls him Samuel Samuel he gets out of bed he runs into Eli his mentor he says what do you want Eli says well, what do you mean what do I want I didn't call you yeah, I heard your voice. You called my name. No, I didn't go back to bed. And it happened again. And again, Samuel asked, why do you keep calling me? And Eli finally discerned that this was the Lord calling him. See, Samuel didn't quite respond quickly and readily to the voice of God. But the answer is because he was a novice. He was young. And so it's understandable sometimes when you're young in the Lord, you don't fully understand everything that's going on. That's why it's important that in church work that we don't put novices in place in positions of leadership because of their immaturity at the time. I know when I got saved, I didn't understand anything about church and ministry and Christian service. As your pastor mentioned, I was raised in a Catholic home. How many of you were raised Catholic? Ave Maria. Well, you know what I'm talking about. And I got saved. I'm in the men's home. And they're over there prophesying and speaking in tongues. And I didn't know any of that stuff. When I heard tongues the first time, I thought it was Hebrew. <laughs> what the heck is that? Yabba dabba do. What is that? <laughs> Why did Fred Flintstone come in here? I, never, I didn't know. I saw people getting slain. I'm like, what the heck is that? And at that time, I wasn't ready for leadership or ministry. Uh -huh. Samuel was just a baby, a young boy. And so finally, when the Lord called him, he finally responded after, thank God for mentors. Thank God for somebody. Many of you have a mentor. Some of you don't. But those of you that do, you should thank God for them. Because they help you. Somebody say amen. Now, on the positive side, there are others who were really true first responders. A classic case is Peter. Peter was a, a fisherman. We all know this. He had a boat, probably his own, and he had a little business there. He would go out and catch fish and, and uh, sell it. Whatever he didn't sell, he'd eat with his family. He had a wife and family. He had his mother-in-law living with him. <laughs> you know you better be bringing home food when you got your mother-in-law living with you. Take care of her daughter. Right, he's got bills to pay, mouths to feed. And one day the Lord shows up and says, Simon, your name should no longer be called Simon, but you're going to be called Peter. All your life you've been catching fish. But when I get through with you, you're going to catch men for the kingdom of God. <laughs> Throw down your nets and follow me. Did Peter say, wait a second. Wait a minute. I can't just follow you right now. I got a business to run. I got a family to support. I got a mother-in-law living with me. I mean, I, I got responsibilities. I can't just throw down. I'll tell you what, Lord. I'll tell you what. Lord, let's do this. Because, you know, we're good at this, right? Uh, why don't I throw on my net? I'll follow you on weekends. Okay? I'll catch fish Monday to Friday, but Sunday is your day. There are people, even if... Even in Victory Outreach, even better when even in Victory Outreach, <laughs> whose idea of commitment is only coming to church on Sunday morning. Now, thank God, at least you do come on Sunday morning. But what? That's the limit of your commitment? Huh? You just want to be like a part-time believer? Ooh, that hurt. Come on, somebody. Listen, Jesus didn't say, listen, you can follow me and be a part-time disciple. He said, no, if you want to be my disciple, you must leave your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your, your everything. 
Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Another example is Saul of Tarsus. As we all know him later on to become Paul the Apostle, but he was a Pharisee. And he was on a mission from God, arresting Christians. And there he was, you know the story, Acts chapter 9. He's on a dusty road to Damascus, thinking he's on a mission from God. And a light shined from heaven. You think, come on, a light shine from heaven? You know, last year in the sky, we had this green light. I'm not making this up. Anybody saw it in the news? Yeah, you saw it, right? And it freaked people out. There were accidents that took place. The people were driving on the freeway. They started focusing on the green light. Well, a light shined from heaven. And Paul or Saul of Tarsus was knocked down. How many know sometimes in order for us to respond to the will of God within our life, sometimes God has to allow us to be knocked down. God has to knock us down. Saul is knocked to the ground and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who is this? It's Jesus whom you are persecuting. And I love Saul of Tarsus' answer. He doesn't say, shut up, give me a break. Really? Come on, prove it. Huh? No, maybe you're Abraham or Moses. That's not what he said. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That should be our prayer this morning. When we come into church and we serve God, our prayer should always be, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Paul was a first responder. Another one is found in the book of Isaiah, our author this morning. Instead of going to the 43rd chapter, let's back up and go to Isaiah chapter 6. And we pick it up in verse 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew, a seraphim is an angel, having his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go first? And look what Isaiah says. Here I am, Lord. Send me. I'm ready. That is a first responder. That's the kind of generation we want to see rise up in victory outreach. A generation will say, here I am. Send me. I'll go where I have to go. I'll be what you want me to be. I'll say what you want me to say. Come on, somebody. Say amen. There's a scripture found in the Bible, and I want you to finish it for me. I'll quote the first part, and you finish it. Many are called, but, let's try it again. Many are called, but, uh, the way I interpret that verse, many are called, but not everybody makes the cut. Now, I, I'm not a really good golfer. I'm a horrible golfer. I like to watch golf, though, sometimes. I haven't been watching it lately. But in all these tournaments that Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson play, Jordan Spieth and all these guys, they play for four days. They start on Thursday. They go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And there's usually about 100 and some golfers in every tournament. But not all 150 golfers make it to the last round. After the second round is completed, they cut. They have a line. You have to have a certain score, right? You have to make the cut, Right? I mean, it's big news when Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson or Jordan Speed, these are the top golfers, don't make the cut. Are you making the cut this morning? Many are called, but few make the cut. Somebody say amen. Huh? Thank God that Saul, Paul, the apostle, he made the cut. Isaiah made the cut by saying, Lord, here I am, send me. These are the first responders. Now, when I think of first responders, I want to give you three characteristics of first responders. Number one, the first characteristic is they volunteer. What I mean by that is, I'm not saying they don't get paid. They're professional. And they get well paid, some of my guests, the policemen, the firemen, emergency medical personnel. But what I'm saying by the word volunteer, in other words, they make a conscious decision to dedicate their lives to assisting others in time of need. In other words, you don't get drafted into the fire department. You don't get drafted into the nursing field. Somebody say amen. It's a decision that you make. One of our ministers, he's not a senior pastor. He pastors a church in Philadelphia, and him and his wife are home directors, but his wife was studying for nursing school. And last year, she told me, Brother Philip, I, I finally graduated. I'm now a registered nurse. 
And I said, you know, in Victory Outreach, I know we probably have other nurses, but you're the only second woman I know in all Victory Outreach to do that. I go, it's a difficult pr profession to choose. I go, why did you want to do it? She goes, because I, I, I made a decision. I want to dedicate my life to nursing. See, those are people that serve in that field make a conscious decision to dedicate themselves. And that decision requires commitment. Somebody say amen. See, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to force you into something that you don't want to do. He'll ask you. He'll call you. He'll plead with you. Huh? He'll woo you. He'll do everything he can. Huh? But it's still up to you and I. Somebody say amen. It's a decision we make. Just like when we got saved, we decided to follow Jesus. When I first got saved, there was a song we used to sing. I don't know if we sing it anymore, but I'm sure you know the words. I have decided. I have decided. I have decided. Last part. No turning back, guys. No turning back. You and I made a conscious decision to serve God, and there's no turning back. But yet the reality is we have a lot of lost treasures out there. Even here in San Diego, there in our church in Chino, or in the L.A. area, we have a lot of lost treasures. You know, this ministry, this church, I, I've, been a, I've been coming to this church since it first started. They've won a lot of souls to the Lord. A lot of seed has been planted. A lot of people have come to Christ through this ministry, but yet some uh, couldn't make the cut. They went back on their decision. We have a lot of lost treasures out there, but you and I thank God this morning for his mercy. Thank God for his grace that we made a decision. No turning back. I mean, really, when you step in, what are you going to go back to if you go back to the world? What, your neighborhood? What, you go stand on your corner back in your neighborhood? You're too old for that now. The guys you used to run with, they ain't there no more. The girls you used to party with, they ain't there no more. Now they're grandmas. They have like 15 kids. You want to go back to that? You want to go back to the pit that God took you out of? You want to go back to the slum that God took you out of? You want to go back to the garbage that God took you out of? You know, I... I there's a service that we all are familiar with every every week. It's the garbage department. Now we stop and think about it. We stop and think about it. They come and pick up our garbage. That's great, isn't it? I mean, you got to pay for it, but you put it out. Well, I don't put it out. I got my grandson now, so I tell him to put it out. <laughs> we put our garbage, what do you call it? Garbage tr trash cans out, and they come and pick it up. And they take it away from you. Praise the Lord. What, do you go? You want to go to the garbage dump and see how your trash is doing? Oh, where's my trash? Where's my garbage? Is that what you want, you want to do? But that's what we do when we choose to stop serving the Lord and try to go back. The Bible describes it as a vomit, as a dog trying to eat his own vomit. That's gross, huh? Well, that's how gross it is. Come on, somebody. That decision requires total commitment, and you know this. Huh? Secondly, they're well trained. You can't just become a fireman or a nurse or a policeman, you know, sign a piece of paper. No, you got to get trained for this stuff. Anyone who wants to do this kind of work must be well equipped and well trained. Ephesians tells us that God gives us leadership within the church. Ephesians 4:11, that God gives us pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers, huh? For the perfecting of the saints for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. I got asked one time by one of the guys in the training center, one of the young kids, hey, Brother Philip, what's one of the things that's really helped you be a part of this ministry all these years? I go, well, I, I thank God I've had the same pastor. I've, my spiritual father is still around. Come on, somebody. I mean, his... his his son is my pastor now, right? But I, 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 had, I had spiritual leadership in my life, right? And I've been serving the Lord a long time, guys. What you see me doing now, I've been, I preached my first revival in 1973. Shut up, you weren't even born. 
I mean, I've taught, I've trained, I've done missionary work, all that stuff. But yet, I still recognize that even myself, I still need spiritual leadership over my life. I mean, that's why we should thank God for our pastors. Thank God for our leadership. Thank God that God sets up leadership for us to train us, to equip us. Somebody say amen. amen. Some guys say, well, you know, Jesus is my pastor. Oh, shut up. <laughs> what you're saying there is you're so full of pride, nobody can teach you. You're so spiritual. You're so holy that nobody can teach you. Listen, I, I, thank, I thank God I got a pastor. Amen. amen. The pastor I have now, I met him when he was about one and a half years old. He was in diapers. His sister wasn't even born. He was like one and a half years old. I, was in, I, I came in, and there he was running around the church, long blonde hair, curls. I thought it was a girl. I go, come here, little girl. And he spit at me. Now that young boy is my pastor. I got no problem with that. God raises up whom God raises up. Who am I to argue with God? Who am I to question God? Well, why did they put that guy in leadership? Why did they put that guy in a pastor? Hey, God did it. Who are you and I to question the Lord? Somebody say amen. That's what, thank God we have all these things now to get trained. We have the vetti that some of you haven't even taken advantage of. Okay, I, I, I don't understand this. You can stay at home in your pajamas and study the word of God. I mean, me, when I went to Bible school, I had to get up every morning, get in the car, drive down to La Puente. The Bible school was in La Puente then. Our church was in East L.A. Huh? Sit there in school. And, you know, the night before, we were out fellowshipping, Denny's, whatever. Yeah, Mary, in school, and mind me, what to, you went to, if you went to Bible college, you know what I'm talking about. It's not easy sitting in class. Huh? But now, oh, my God. He's good. You're online right there. There it is. Whoop, pops up. Huh? And you have all these men of God teaching you. In your house. You can have a cup of coffee and be eating while you're studying. <laughs> Thank God that God gives us the, the resources to be equipped. And then thirdly and lastly, these people, these first responders are very courageous. When you and I run out of a building, they run into the building. Come on, somebody. God forbid, but if this building was to catch fire right now, all of us would be running out quick. We'd be running out headed for those AK signs. But the fire department would be running inside. Uh-huh. When there's a flood, they go into dangerous situations. Huh? It's not easy. And for us to have courage. But God has called our ministry to some of the most dangerous cities and into the some of the most, some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in all Victory Outreach. Now, here in San Diego, and I don't mean this to, you know, put you down like that, but San Diego, he's got some rough area here. I saw it the last, yesterday, I pulled in. Chicano Park is still there. Logan Heights. I know the neighborhood. And it's a tough neighborhood. You got cholos, you got gangs, drugs here. But, man, if you've lived on the East Coast... If you've been back east, New York, Philadelphia, Jersey, they don't say Jersey, Jersey, Newark, oh my God. Uh huh. And then overseas in, in the Philippines, Barrio Tonda, oh my God, what a ghetto. I went to Nigeria, my God. You talk about poverty. When I was in India, I'm like, Lord, have mercy. Uh huh. But these are the areas that God has called us to. And people say, but how do you guys do it? Well, God just gives us the courage and the strength to go into these neighborhoods. Some years ago, one of our pastors, and I'll tell you his name, Pastor Titus, Philadelphia, who just celebrated 25 years of ministry there in Philadelphia. All right. Well, he was taking home a church member one night, and the police came, a case of mistaken identity, and rolled up on the, the Philadelphia PD and just started whooping on him with billy clubs. Cracked his skull open, beat him to a pulp. It's a miracle he didn't die from that. Rushed to the hospital. He survived, of course. Later on, I found out about it, and he told me about it. And he recuperated. 
I'm in Colorado Springs, or I forget actually where I was, but I was I think in Colorado Springs, and I was having dinner with Nikki Cruz. That's where he lives. And I'm telling Nikki about Titus. I go, ah, you see what happened to Titus? Go, oh, man, Titus. Oh, feel I love Titus, man, I love Titus. I go, it's not Titus, it's Titus. <laughs> so I told him about what happened. Oh, feel I love him, I love Titus. I love him so much. I go, well, he, yeah, the police. He go, Phil, you, you set it up. I go preach for him two days. You set it up. He set it up. I go preach two days because I love him. I love Tyra. I go, you'll go for two days? He goes, yes. Two days in Philadelphia. Yes, you set up. I love Tyra. You'll go for two days? Yes, for free. He goes, I don't love him that much. <laughs> That is so bad. That is so bad. And I don't care. What's it going to do to me? Amen. Um, okay. So I get there, and we're having the crusade. It's the first night. Watch this. And they pick us up at our hotel, me and Nikki, to go to the service. And it was early. So I said, you know, Nick, we have a lot of time. I told the driver, Jose, Take us through the Badlands. This is an area in Philadelphia. Lord have mercy. No, 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 no. I thought I'd seen ghetto. Shoot. It was summertime. It was hot. There were pimps, bloods, crips, gang members, prostitutes. I mean, if you started walking from one corner to the next, you'd be hooked by the time you got to the other side. <laughs> oh, my God. We're just like, and we roll in there. And, I, and I'm showing Nikki. I said, Nick, you know, this is the battle. See, look at this man. Look at this man. Look at all the peoples. <laughs> I said, what? What did you say? <laughs> and I'm showing him. He goes, this area is terrible. This is terrible, man. I go, yeah, this is, this is what God has called Victor Irish to. Gee, thank you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh, my God. These people need prayer. They need the gospel. I go, they need the what? Oh, the gospel. So anyway, I'm going to close this. He says, man, look at this, man. I go, Nick, we have time. Why don't we pull over? Jose, you want to pull over? We'll get off and you go talk to some of the gang members. Phil, what's the matter for you, man? You crazy? I ain't going to get out of the car. Then get out of here, man. <laughs> I said, oh, you got into, used to be in them fancy churches, uh, in them middle class, the upper class churches. I said, this is the area that God has called us. This is where Victory Outreach goes. We go to the worst of the worst to reach the lost. Hallelujah. And it takes a certain amount of courage, but God is able to give it to us. Just like these responders, when they go rescue somebody in a flood or a hurricane, uh -huh, they don't question, they don't hesitate. They don't look for a shortcut out. They respond quickly and readily. What about you this morning as the worship team comes? What about you this morning? God's been dealing with you. God's been challenging you. God's been speaking to you to find your place in the body of Christ. God has a plan for your life. He wants you to respond to that plan. Some of you, God, God, God has even placed a calling upon your life to ministry. Who knows out of this very pulpit, you might be getting launched out one day. This is ascending church. Victory San Diego has always been a sending church, and it's going to continue. And trust me, within the next few years, you're going to see an acceleration of people being sent out from this church like never before. I want us to stand this morning as the worship team makes their way. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I'm going to open up the altar. I'm going to open up the altar. And the Lord said, whom will go for us? Whom shall we send? Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be what you want me to be. I'm ready to say what you want me to say. I'm willing to do what you want me to do. Think about that. It's a decision that requires commitment. But this is what we're talking about this morning. A commitment to dedicate your heart to the Lord. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Before I open up the altar and make a general altar call, every head bowed, every eye closed. And... I need every believer just praying quickly. Maybe there's somebody here this morning. You don't know Christ as your Savior. You don't know the Lord. And yet you've resisted and resisted and resisted. But yet this morning, you should end that resistance. 
and give God a chance to work in your life. I thank God nearly 48 years ago, I, I finally gave up. I said, okay, God, you win. You know, it's called the foolishness of fighting God. You can't fight God forever. Well, every head is bowed, every eye closed. I want those, hey, Brother Phil, pray for me. I want to ask Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. Or maybe you used to be saved, but you kind of had some problems. And you've drifted away. And you want to come back. God, you need God to restore you this morning. Or maybe you've given your life to the Lord, but come on, you're not really serving him. You made a decision, but you're not living up to that. He said, I want all those that want prayer this morning. The count of three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Lift your hand for prayer right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless your hand in the back. Anybody else? God bless you, sir. You may put your hands down. God bless you. Hallelujah. God bless you. Yes, I see your hands, young ladies. Yes, I see your hands. You may put them down. Is there anybody else? All right. Everyone can open up their eyes and pick up their heads. Nobody sneaks into heaven. Everybody that Jesus called in the Bible, he called them openly, honestly, and publicly. He called, Bart he called Zacchaeus down from a tree. He called uh, Bartimaeus from a street corner. He called Peter from his boat. I'm calling you from your seat. So I want those that raise their hands, and then I want to make a general altar call for anyone else that wants to come forward. You felt God speaking to you through this message this morning. You felt God challenging your heart to respond to his will, to respond to the plan that God has for your life. As we sing a chorus, the altars are open.